Hello, I'm Wes Allen. The Perkins Center for Preaching Excellence is committed to helping pastors as they strive continually to be effective and faithful proclaimers of God's good news. We're convinced that one element of that process entails reading good homiletical literature that pushes us into new ways of thinking about why and how we preach. One book we consider a must read of this sort deals not only with why and how, but also who. Who has had restricted access to the pulpit? Our author says black women. And what might preaching look like when black women claim their voice for proclamation? The answer lies in ingenuity. And that's the title of the book we're discussing today, Ingenuity, Preaching as an Outsider, published by Abingdon Press in 2018. It was written by Dr. Lisa L. Thompson, who's with me today. Dr. Thompson is the Associate Professor and Cornelius Vanderbilt Chancellor Faculty Fellow of Black Homiletics and Liturgics at Vanderbilt Divinity School. Lisa, welcome. Thank you, Wes. Good to be here. Thank you to you and Alice and the McPass Center for making this opportunity available. Well, I wonder if you wouldn't mind starting off our conversation by naming the problem that Black women preachers face as outsiders and how you see ingenuity as a key to responding to that problem. Yes, uh, an outsider is a tricky word, right? So one of the things that I'm really trying to talk about in this book is the idea when others perceive you as outsider or have feel they have the power or authority to render you as an outsider. Um, so part of the problem or one of the quandaries that I really want to address is what happens when the Black preaching woman's body shows up in pulpit space. And pulpit spaces that have histories that come with them, pulpit spaces that have privileged particular bodies over and against Black women's bodies and their voices. And whichever bodies have been privileged in those spaces also means the way in which they make meaning or what they claim is truth is also privileged in that space. Therefore, when you have what I would call kind of this contested body show up, offer their voice, their interpretation, well, it opens the opportunity up for their very message to be contested itself. So what I'm most concerned about is trying to figure out how do we help communities of faith in their vast understandings of preaching, move past just uh, the mechanics of what preaching sounds like, looks like, to really get to the center of what makes this a sermon, what makes this a word worth listening to, and what makes this worth us receiving it as truth. And so moving past the body as an obstacle, but really seeing the preacher, the person who shows up as an opportunity to understand word and word from God in a more expanded way. And so as one perceived as an outsider, I mean, mm -hmm. it seems to me there's some advantages once you've sort of claimed that and, and, and ingenuity, I think, is, is part of that. So you, you really want to say you come with some different gifts and, and aspects of voice and life perspective and all to share that, that Black men, white men like me can't offer. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is absolutely at the core of the book. The idea is the more people we get around the table, the more knowledge that we have, the more access we have to what I want to call some of the holiest truth that we only get shatters of the light from, right? So we think of this, this grand light up here. We only get kind of shatters and shards of that light anytime one of us speaks and offers something. So there is something about the power in the diversities of the proclaimer. One of the things that I'm most concerned about more so than thinking about um, not it being a matter of difference, but a matter of to whom are we accountable in our preaching and our teaching and to what lives are we accountable to sustaining. There is an ethic at the core of ingenuity that we are privileging life, life more abundantly, and that means the opportunity to flourish and opportunity to be free as part of the core of the gospel message. So if part of a community kind of staying most true to its core beliefs is making this possible. And my concern is when people uh, say that they are proclaiming and yet proclaim what ends up being death unto someone else, right? So yes, and I wanna say black women have something else to offer just like every single body has something else to offer based on their lived experience and what we end up saying and doing in the name of text and tradition. So often it's those, uh, if I'm hearing you right, those like me who 
who um, manifest a great deal of privilege in our society, who intentionally or not preach death to those who don't share my privilege. Absolutely. And it's not only those that uh, look like you, what do I always like to say, privilege and patriarchy and sex, uh, sexism and all the isms are equal opportunity employers, right? It becomes, the, <laughs> it becomes the air we breathe and even can internalize, even the most minoritized body can inter internalize um, those tropes and norms. And I am saying, yes, get more people around the table to vet our ideas and vet our messages. Uh, the other thing, though, about ingenuity in this regard is to say, well, you have opposition to your message being received when you're a contested body. Some people would ask me, why not throw out the entire tradition? I say, if you're going to move past the tradition, valid option, move on, preach elsewhere. There are plenty of affirming communities. This is about using the best possibilities of tradition to do something else with them, right? So this looks like the... Uh, idea of imagination in some Black preaching traditions, not just Black preaching traditions, but some Black preaching traditions, the gift of storytelling and what I call filling out the story with content from the world today and how the, the narrative is just kind of brought into real live perspective. I'm concerned with what happens if we color that narrative in based on the lives of Black women, based on the lives of some of the most disenfranchised folk in our world, what happens when we interpret scripture? From what angles do we interpret scripture? If we interpret it from the perspective of the outsider in the text, instead of the major character, what else emerges? Now, I assume from what you've said and the very fact that you wrote this book that you're <laughs> um, actually hopeful that reform can come in these ways and um, Black women can be welcomed in the pulpit. It can make a difference in that pro uh, proclamation <laughs> uh, widespread. Is, is that... Fair? Yes, I want to believe. I still want to believe and help my unbelief, right? <laughs> so this is the tension of this book. I have some things I want to accomplish, right, in terms of liberation, in terms of life abundant and flourishing. And at the same time, I am attempting to describe practices that are already taking shape on the ground. Part of the book is saying, listen, people may be rejected or perceived as an outsider, yet somehow they've managed to preach anyway and be received anyway. So the book is trying to get inside of what's actually happening there. What happens when Black women riff on a tradition or traditions, even in predominantly white spaces, that have not privileged their voices but still gain a hearing? So in the book, or listening, I got my apologies. Um, so in the book, I'm trying to work around, and if we then capitalize on those things intentionally for the sake of a sermon and sermon development, what more could we accomplish in transforming a tradition? It, so it's not a quiet secret. I'm trying to turn a tradition on itself to make it something better. <laughs> well, I, I, with you, I'm hopeful as well. <laughs> bring you. So let me um, let me turn to the world today. You talked about drawing on the world, painting uh, the world, and that uh, Black women can bring aspects of telling that telling those stories that that men have not been telling all. We are, um, at the moment we speak, we're still in the shadow of the Black Lives Movement that uh, really became strong um, or, or very public after uh, the death of George Floyd, even though it had already been around before. Um, we're speaking on October 29th. This will probably be released a little bit later, but we've just had the death of Walter Wallace in Philadelphia. Is there, in, um, in your scholarly sense, something that Black women preachers can bring to this conversation that's been missing? Yeah. So first of all, when we think about the pandemic uh, in multiple ways, COVID and the racialized pandemic, some of the most vulnerable groups are Black women. And add the categories there, you want to add Black queer women, uh, economically depressed, all of these make uh, the possibility of death to the lives of black in, in the lives of black women more acute and there is something when you are interpreting scripture and text from a place where death is a looming possibility and not just looming as distant but an ever impending possibility that life is always on the line that's a different way of interpreting scripture one of the things i wrestled with when the 
pandemics came and we began flooding online, and I've said this in a couple different forums, was the questions that preachers were now just asking, what do I say and what do I do? And I was struck because this is both inside black preaching traditions and outside of tradition. And I was struck by the idea because I thought, well, black folk have always been dying, right? So, and some folk have always lived in ongoing existential crisis. So my, my question was, what have you been preaching all along? Have we really ignored uh, the edges of the world in our preaching all along? So absolutely, I think there's something that the lives and attending to the lives of Black women um, can do and bring to the preaching moment. And what it really brings is challenging the preacher to move beyond their own outlook and think about how their message lives in the lives of the most vulnerable at any given time. That also requires being in conversation, right? So you must increase, we must increase our conversation partners. If we do not understand uh, the variety of life that folk have to battle with or live through, we'll never be able to preach about it. Well, thank you for your wise words. Thank you for this book, Ingenuity, Preaching as an Outsider. I hope all of our viewers will go out and get a copy and read it cover to cover. Uh, stay tuned. We'll have other books coming up in the Must Read series and keep looking out for our Preaching in the Pandemic of Racism video series. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Wes.